It's a very great pleasure to be here today. I, in working on my book for 10 years, I became, I think, how should I put it? I thought I was a personal friend of Thomas Starking, and to be in a room with a lot of other personal friends of his is heartwarming indeed. <clears throat> what I want to begin with talking about is the New England background. We haven't heard that much about it. Uh, Star King's father was a Universalist minister, and the Unitarians in the 19th century were university trained, but the Universalists were not. They uh, had a, an apprenticeship with another uni Universalist minister, but they did not go to Harvard necessarily. And so Thomas Farrington King, Star King's father, was a shoemaker in New York City. And on July 4th, 1821, he gave, he was asked to give the patriotic address to his fellow New York working men. He was asked to do, usually they had a professional person give this address, but he was known for his eloquence. And he gave this fiery, eloquent speech, which I happen to have read in the New York Historical Society. And it was so eloquent that his fellow workers said, you are missing it by being a shoemaker. You belong in the pulpit. And so he became a universalist minister. And uh, sadly, he died when his son, his oldest child, Thomas Star King, was only a teenager. And when he died, Star King was unable to finish formal education. But he did apprentice with some of the uh, universalist ministers who were his father's friends and became an incredibly well-schooled autodidact, but with help from his father's friends. He became fluent in a number of languages. When he was a very young man, he spoke on Goethe in Boston, which took a lot of guts because the Boston Unitarians were all infatuated with Goethe. And here's this 21-year-old or 20-year-old who's talking to an audience of people who are Goethe enthusiasts about their man. Um, and he then was called to serve his father's church when he was only 21. And uh, he went to New York on a trip and presented himself at the study of a prominent Unitarian clergyman in New York, Henry Bellows. And Henry Bellows was so impressed with him that Henry Bellows became his advocate. And a couple of years later, he was called to serve a Unitarian church, the Hollis Street Church. And this was very unusual to have a non-Harvard man called to serve a Unitarian church. But um, Henry Bellows' word carried a lot of weight. And uh, he, he, the church that he was called to serve was troubled. The minister that he was replacing had been a fiery advocate of temperance in a church with a congregation of rum merchants. <laughs> was not calculated to win friends. But somehow Star King brought his church along. He didn't, wasn't the fiery abolitionist when he first got there, but I believe the membership quintupled during his tenure at Hollis Street. He also, um, in order to supplement his salary, became a fixture on the Lyceum circuit. The Lyceum circuit was, in the days before television, lecturers would travel all, and particularly after the railroad, they would travel on a, uh, well, Thomas Star King is located in Boston, but he is lecturing in Cleveland, in Cincinnati, in St. Louis, and getting places on the railroad. So he became a very well-known public intellectual because of the Lyceum circuit and because um, his eloquence made a big impression on people. But I also want to talk about the Unitarian denomination that he became a leading light of. The Unitarians were the heirs of the Puritans. They had a different theology they broke with the uh, Congregationalists over the issue of Christ's divinity, 
but they were imbued with the same, why did the Puritans come to the New World? And we know, you know, they didn't like the practices of the Church of England, but they, you've probably all heard about how um, John Winthrop preached a sermon on board the Arbella that brought the uh, Puritans to New England, and he said, we shall be as a city on a hill. We shall set up an example of Christian virtue that is so compelling that not only can we redeem ourselves, but we can be an example for the church in the old world. And so the Unitarians had broken with the, that heritage in terms of their theology, but they still had that same sense of purpose. But it, it was channeled in a different direction. That's why I say Starking was a man on a mission. The great uh, leader at the dawn of Unitarianism was a man named William Ellery Channing. Uh, he was the most prominent Unitarian clergyman in the early 19th century. And in the 1820s, he gave a talk called Remarks on National Literature. And this is what Channing said, and I'm obviously paraphrasing it. He said, we have all the elements in our political system to be a great nation. We, the, de the democracy we embody is something wonderful, but we need a culture to go along with our great political system. And our denomination can produce the writers that will provide the sinews of the national culture. And who were some of the great writers of the subsequent period? A lot of them were, in fact, Unitarians. Uh, Emerson had started as a Unitarian, but he's not the only one. Melville worshiped at a Unitarian church in New York. Um, so there's a coterie of Unitarian intellectuals in Boston. And Star King, who had come, whose father had been a shoemaker, is not only on the Lyceum circuit, but he's very plugged in. He was a clubbable man. He was genial. His letters are just overflowing with wit. And um, you can just tell that he was good company. And so he was brilliant, and he was good company, and he was friends with all the leading intellectuals in Boston. One of my favorite, uh, I, in my book I trace, my book. Uh, <laughs> In my book, I trace his reactions to Emerson. At first, it's like, ooh, I'm going to meet Emerson, ooh. And then a, a year or two later, it's, well, I performed an, an imitation of Henry Ward Beecher for Emerson, and uh, the great man seemed to be very entertained. So th this was, he had imbued the sense of mission. He had this incredible set of connections in Boston. and not least was his friendship with a man named James T. Fields. Uh, James T. Fields was not a clergyman, as so many of these other intellectuals were, but uh, he was the publisher. He was the co-publisher of Tickner and Fields, a very significant publishing house, but he was also the editor of the Atlantic Monthly, which was a leading publication. When Dickens came to the US for the second time, the only private home he would stay in was that of James T. Fields and Annie Fields in Boston. So James T. Fields not only knew all the literati in the US, but he had these transatlantic connections too. And the letters between Star King and James, James T. Fields are, Dear Jamie. I mean, they were really good friends. Fields sends him a letter from Tennyson's Cottage. Alfred Lord Tennyson, the great poet, and sends a sprig, apparently, uh, some flowering plant there. And then Star King writes to Fields and says, we don't have, we grow bigger squash in California than members of the literati, but our scenery is pretty spectacular. And he, s he sends a sprig of a flower and that pressed flower is still in that letter in the Huntington Library. So it was quite a thrill to find that flower that has you know, been preserved for 150 years. <laughs>
So why did this man leave Boston when he had this really interesting life? I think partly it's financial. The San Francisco church can afford to pay him more than the Hollis Street church. And he had the, we now know, delusion that if he came to California, he could kind of kick back and take it easy. Uh, he wouldn't have to do the Lyceum circuit. But I also think that there was a sense of mission. And one of the reasons I say this is that um, his son-in-law, Horace Davis, wrote many years after Star King's death, well, the denomination had a sense that a really good man was needed in San Francisco. And we wanted to send one of the strongest we could find. And so Star King was the man they chose. And why did they think a good man was needed in San Francisco? Well, you heard some of the reasons last night, those of you who were attend attended last night. The town had had two vigilante episodes. And uh, just slightly more than six months before Star King arrived, there had been a duel. Uh, and this was the setting for the duel. There was no Republican Party to speak of in California. Uh, slight stirrings, but nothing like the Republican Party as it was emerging in other parts of the country. The main political contest was between two wings of the Democratic Party, the really racist ones and the somewhat racist ones. <laughs> uh, the really racist ones were the Shivs. They were led by William Gwynn, who the whole time he served as a U.S. Senator from California, owned 200 slaves in Mississippi. And then the somewhat racist ones who did not support the extension of slavery were led by San Francisco's David Broderick. And um, in 1859, one of Gwynne's lieutenants was a state Supreme Court Chief Justice, David Terry. And he, Terry, began insulting Broderick. And here's one of the things he said to insult Broderick. He said that Broderick was closer to Frederick Douglass, the black abolitionist, than to Stephen Douglass, the Demo white democratic politician. Well, those were fighting words. I mean, that shows you that even David Broderick was not, you know, like, David <laughs> Frederick Douglass, no, no, no. Uh, so there was a duel. David Terry resigned from the state Supreme Court. They fought a duel just over the border into San Mateo County. And a recently resigned state Supreme Court Chief Justice shot a sitting US Senator and killed him. <laughs> and that was in September of 1859. And in April, late April of 1860, Star King arrived. Now you know why the people who were concerned about California and its political and cultural and moral future <coughs> wanted to send Star King on a mission. When he arrived, he had a cultural authority that no one else in California had at that time. Because he, oh, they were, people in, in this state were very impressed that he was friends with Emerson and, um, and people like that. He arrived. April 28th, which was a Saturday. And while he was still on the board the ship in the harbor, members of the Congregation of First Unitarian visited him and said, oh, you must be travel weary. You don't have to preach tomorrow. And he said, no, I've got a sermon written. And he preached the very next day. And this is how interested the country was in this whole man on a mission. One of the letters that I found to Star King was from Edward Everett Hale, a prominent Unitarian who wrote Man, Man Without a Country. Um, and Hale says, I think it was dated May 5th, so it's like a week after this sermon. And he says, um, we know that you preached the next day because the news was, tra was carried by Pony Express to St. Louis and then traveled by telegraph to us in Boston. So um, there was great interest 
in this whole undertaking. Almost immediately, his church began to grow. The Episcopalian Fremonts, who were the most famous couple in California at the time, began to worship at uh, Star King's church. And he was, over time, able to talk about abolitionism. He was able to talk about the necessity for using black troops in the war, once the war broke out. And he, because he had, somebody last night referred to him as a rock star, and really that's a good term. He came as a celebrity, and his celebrity only grew. And that gave him the capacity to say things that were completely out of the norm of the public discourse as carried on by white people in the state of California at that time. And he didn't lose his audience. And that was a great thing. Um, he comes, as I say, in late April. By July, he was in Yosemite. And then, and, write, and later that year, he began to write about it for an Eastern audience. And on August 1st, 1860, and we heard about this talk last night, he addressed the assembled black community of San Francisco. August 1st is the anniversary of black, of uh, emancipation, British emancipation in the West Indies. And Star King told the assembled audience that the greatest day in the last hundred years is not the American Revolution. It's when the British Parliament laid its millions on the table to, in honor of a principle that up until then had been purely abstract. And that was a pretty remarkable thing for someone to say. And that's just from late April to August 1st. So he began to, he was referred to last night as a catalyst. He began to make these catalytic <laughs> statements very early after he arrived. Uh, after Sumter, he began to make fiery pro-union speeches um, even before Sumter. He gives a speech on Washington's birthday, February 22nd, 1861. Secession has begun, but the fighting hasn't. And he writes a letter to his best friend describing the speech he gave on February 22nd. And that letter is in the Graduate Theological Union archives in Berkeley. And I, in the mid-90s, I curated an exhibit on the history of San Francisco for the public library here, and I borrowed that letter. And then I was hooked. That letter was so compelling and so dramatic, and the voice was so appealing that um, I spent 10 years writing this book. Um, the state had been dominated by the Democratic Party after Sumter. In this city, there began to be pro-union rallies. I wish I, I should have done a PowerPoint, if nothing else, just to show you this one picture. But there are wonder, there's a wonderful picture of a rally on Market Street with Thomas Tarking, whom you can't even identify. but. We know from the photographer's description that it's Star King to, uh, talking to an audience on Market Street. And he really had an impact on public opinion. And the reason we know this, among others, is that the governor of California at this time was a man named John Downey. Downey, California is named for John Downey. And he was, uh, he was a Democrat. And he writes to one of his pals in Southern California and says, a tornado has hit this state. Black Republicanism is being preached. And you know, oh, isn't this terrible? Well, the tornado was Thomas Starr King. And um, just a couple more things I want to mention as some of his achievements. We heard about the Sanitary Commission last night. When the Civil War broke out, a war that would kill 750,000 men. There were 26 army doctors. The women of the North knew that they didn't want their sons and husbands and brothers 
to die unnecessarily. And about 10 years earlier in the Crimean War, a woman had had a great impact on mortality in that war, and that was Florence Nightingale. And so they called it the Sanitary Commission ultimately because uh, sanitation, keeping wounds clean and so on was a very effective way of saving lives in those days. And so the women had a meeting in April in New York. And of course, in those days, women didn't take the initiative. Women didn't have the vote. So a lot of men were horrified. Well, these women are well-meaning, but they could make a lot of trouble. So the men were in charge. Henry Bellows, the Unitarian minister, was the leader of the Sanitary Commission. But who were the foot soldiers? The women. They were the ones who were, they were something like 8,000 soldiers, aid societies, all over the Union states. They were sewing garments for wounded soldiers. They were uh, sending supplies. And this was all very well and good, the in-kind donations. But what did it take to get those supplies to the men-at-arms? It took money. And Star King apparently was waiting for the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, which was issued September 22nd, 1862. And then that same month was when San Francisco threw itself into the fundraising effort for the Sanitary Commission. The Transcontinental Telegraph was a year old at this point. And in just almost exactly the time of the, <laughs> trans uh, of the uh, Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, a wire goes from San Francisco to New York, which was the headquarters of the Sanitary Commission, $100,000 is on deposit with your bankers. The business community of San Francisco raised that much money in 1862 dollars. It was a lot of money in one week. And that was the down payment. And Star King writes to Bellows and says, I, would, I needed to know the war was to end slavery. And then he really threw himself into it. I also argue in my book that he was a cultural broker, that he wanted to build, he wanted to tell Californians why they should care about the Union, and he wanted to tell people in the Northeast, which was his home, why they should care about California other than the gold, which everybody was very interested in, obviously. And so he began to write glowingly about Yosemite in the Northern California landscape for the Boston Evening Transcript. But then he gave a series of lectures about New England poets in San Francisco. And the reason I began with William Ellery Channing and the remarks on national literature, Channing had said literature can be the sinews of a society and ultimately of a country. And that's exactly what Star King was doing. I don't know whether he was, you know, directly influenced by Channing or whether it was just part of the zeitgeist. But he got his friends, uh, James Russell Lowell, John Greenleaf Whittier, Longfellow, William Cullen Bryant, and Oliver Wendell Holmes to send poems. And then he, he gave a series of lectures and analyzed these poems and those lectures are at the Graduate Theological Union Library, and they're very interesting. He, we might not agree with all of his critical judgments, but he certainly took time and put thought into it. And um, so he, he was really trying to teach each section of the country, you know, this is why you should care. By the way, he was so interested in nurturing literary talent in California. Bret Hart was one of his uh, protégés. But another, there was a man, Charles Warren Stoddard, who was a 17-year-old teenager in San Francisco. And he was beginning to write poetry under the pen name of Pip Pepperpod. And Pip Pepperpod was a clerk in a bookstore. And Thomas Starr King, the famous you know, man of the hour, shows up at the bookstore and says, I've been reading your poems and I think they have some merit. 
And he writes a long letter, which is in the Huntington Library, critiquing and saying, your work is good enough. Well, Charles Warren Stoddard had a distinguished literary career. And in 1903, he pub published a book called The Pleasure of His Company, which is a pioneering work of gay literature. So uh, I think it's worth noting that I, I don't say that Sarah King was, had our modern sensibility about such things, but he did nurture a talent that turned out to be a forerunner of gay San Francisco. Let me close by reading you what Star King wrote about Yosemite, which I think is, is pretty wonderful. There's a book called Sacred Places by John Sears, and he says, Thomas Star King sacralized Yosemite because he wrote about it so eloquently. The valley is of such irregular width and bends so much and often so abruptly that there is great variety and frequent surprise in the forms and combinations of the overhanging rocks as one rides along the bank of the stream. The patches of luxuriant meadow with their dazzling green and the grouping of the superb firs 200 feet high that skirt them and that shoot above the stout and graceful oaks and sycamores through which the horse path winds are delightful rests of sweetness and beauty among, amid the threatening awfulness, like the threads and flashes of melody that relieve the towering masses of Beethoven's harmony. The Ninth Symphony is the Yosemite of music. The Merced, which flows through the main aisle we are speaking of, is a noble stream 100 feet wide and 10 feet deep. It is formed chiefly of the streams that leap and rush through the narrower notches above referred to, and it is swollen also by the bounty of the marvelous waterfalls that pour down the ramparts of the wider valley. The sublime poetry of Habakkuk is needed to describe the impression and perhaps the geology of these mighty fissures, and he quotes the Bible, thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. So, once he wrote like that about Yosemite, then a number of artists began to come. Uh, some, many of the early artists, Alfred Bierstadt comes to see Thomas Star King before he goes to Yosemite. Carlton Watkins, who took early photographs, comes to see Thomas Star King in San Francisco before he photographs. Um, so it's quite a, in four years, he changed the nature of the public discourse on slavery and uh, gave an infusion of energy to the Republican Party, acquainted people in the other part of the country with the California landscape, nurtured young literary talent, and by the way, pastored a congregation. So I think the Masons can be very proud of their brother Mason. Thank you.